Just last year, the combined efforts of some of the most passionate individuals across the world was released to widespread critical acclaim and celebration. A wish had finally been granted after years of waiting, for some decades. The continuation of an often overlooked legacy had finally arrived in the form of Sonic Mania. Damn, that animated opening still gives me goosebumps to this day. Well, it was just a matter of time, wasn't it? I've said it many times here, but Sonic Mania was easily my most anticipated thing of 2017. Not just a game, but out of everything. Go back through my videos of 2017 to get a better idea if you haven't seen those already. A return to form for classic Sonic. A sequel to Sonic 3 & Knuckles that doesn't control like a bag of rocks on a treadmill. And a game to truly test the talents of the already impressive Sonic fan team. There was no way this game could go wrong. And, well, since I've taken so long to finally talk about Mania in depth on the channel, and you're right here watching, I guess you're wondering what I think about it now that it's been out for quite a good while. I'll give you this one for free right at the gate, since I'm pretty sure I've mentioned it already in previous videos, not to mention on Twitter, but I know none of you follow me on there anyway. Sonic Mania is the best Sonic game to be released in over 20 years, since the release of Sonic 3 & Knuckles in 1994. However, I do have a lot of issues with it. Do you want to know what and why? Well, now you've got to stick around. I would like to very briefly set the stage for my initial experience playing this game before we truly dive deep, as it was quite special for me. I was staying up until midnight to see if the game would release early on the Australian Nintendo eShop, since our time zone is way earlier than other countries and the Steam version had been delayed. Yes, I bought the game again on Switch with without blinking an eye. And yes, I also bought the collector's edition, but I sold the key it came with, to be fair. I had university on the day that Mania released on, so I couldn't stay up very late, but the half an hour of time I had at midnight when it dropped was joyous. Unfortunately, I didn't know that the amazing opening animation, which I deliberately hadn't watched yet, would only play if you let the title screen idle, so I ended up watching it on YouTube when I went to bed instead of seeing it in-game myself for the first time. It doesn't mean I didn't tear up watching it though. Tyson Hess and his guys knew what they were doing, and Hyper Potion's music gives off a great feeling of, Sonic is finally back, baby. I remember just being so excited and so surprised at all of the cool little details, starting at Angel Island again and seeing the little animations between Green Hill and chemical plant and oh my god blue sphere is in widescreen and it's so smooth mean bean machine we're doing this now this is amazing it was a great time don't believe me on just how excited i was well the real telekinetic fan also known as my good friend jamie was there on the phone with me the whole time and got to hear me in all of my fanboy moments if she's not the top comment on this video then she's now fake fan and i'm disowning her and revoking her status as the real telekinetic fan yeah, you you had made sure you hadn't seen any spoilers. Well, as 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 little as possible. Mm. And I remember there was the, the little animation thing which you were dying to watch, but you didn't, and you were waiting for it to come up, but it never came. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. all I remember. And it never came. And you're like, I've been cheated, but you watched it eventually. You, s you screamed a little bit, like a little girl. That was cute, you know? It was sweet. I, I screamed as, as loud as I could at, at midnight. Yeah, um, yeah. When, right know. in my ears. <laughs> right into my in-ear headphones. Yeah, it was a good time. That's not my fault. It was a really good time. I just remember you commenting a lot about, like, everything. Like, everything that I would have been like, what? That's cool. You were like, oh, this, and this reminds me of this, and this is, like, from that, and then that's that. And I was like, okay, that's cool. And I had no idea, but I appreciate it, and I appreciate your uh, dedication to the uh, the study. And, um, the study of Sonic. The study of Sonic. <laughs> but I don't have the, the years and years of... Um, 
anticipation and build up, you know, that <laughs> yeah. led to the critical darling that was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hate that line. Why did I? Oh, I, I love I, it. I, I, I love it, but I hate it. I'm the real telekinesis. <laughs> I was very happy. I distinctly remember cramming in a little bit more mania in the morning before leaving for uni, and then playing a bunch more of the game on the bus, and then playing the rest of it when I got home that day. It was a joyous time, but it has been many months since that day, and also quite a lot more playthroughs across the PC and Switch version. So what have I found about this game that has justified the length of this video? I mean, I don't know how long it is at the time of recording, but I assume it's decently long. To be clear, I'll be reviewing the Steam version of the game, with a few little mods and tweaks here and there, more on those as we go along. Let's start digging deeper into Sonic Mania. First off, let's begin with a look over the game's plot, of which there is surprisingly little of value, even for a classic Sonic game. Yeah, this is one of the aspects of Mania that was unfortunately a little bit disappointing for me. Unlike something like Sonic CD, the opening animation, while really cool to watch, doesn't act as the actual narrative introduction to the game. I remember that was part of the reason I wanted to wait until I played the game to see it, and why I was so confused when the game just opens with basically the same start as Sonic 3 again. Sonic and Tails are investigating a signal on Angel Island and discover that a bunch of Eggman's Egg Robos are stealing a strange gem called the Phantom Ruby that can warp time and space, which a Chaos Emerald or Time Stone can do anyway, but whatever. This gem warps them around the place and transforms the Egg Robos into the new hard-boiled heavies, and that's basically the plot. Stop Eggman from using the Phantom Ruby. Hey, wait a minute. Why is Angel Island in the ocean again? Shouldn't it be in the sky? Hey, what's with the lack of zone transitions later on during the game? Don't give me this pre-Sonic 3 fade to black garbage. How do we just go from Little Planet to Angel Island with no transition? Ugh, this is a real shame with some of the details in Mania, and I'm sure it's due to rush development. In terms of narrative, the biggest problem with Mania is that the returning zones ruin any sense of scope or rising action to the story. For example, Stardust Speedway is the halfway point of the game, at the same position as Launch Base from Sonic 3. In Sonic 3 though, you really feel that build up, and Launch Base feels like a moment in the story that you've earned with a big fight. The Metal Sonic fight in Stardust Speedway is quite long, similar to Launch launch base, but it doesn't feel like some kind of big moment because he hasn't been built up like the Death Egg was in Sonic 3, if that makes sense. It's not like beating Metal Sonic has any real consequences to the story, you just move on to the next zone. In Sonic 3, you beat Eggman and you stop the Death Egg from launching again, crashing it face first into Angel Island, and this has consequences for later in the game, mainly during Lava Reef and Sky Sanctuary, which funnily enough are often regarded as some of the best zones in Sonic 3 due to their narrative scope and impact. Seeing the Death Egg's face staring down into the dark caves of Lava Reef really builds a sense of purpose to the player's actions and forms a bit of tension. When Knuckles learns of Eggman's true motives and finally teams up with Sonic and Tails, there's a real arc present there. It's simple as hell, but it's something, and it's emotionally satisfying to see this character who's always been one step ahead of you finally lend you a hand. When you ascend to the Sky Sanctuary and see the Death Egg lifting off again, you know how important it is. You can't stop it this time, it's already in the sky and you've got to run like hell and stop it once more. This is the reason why Sonic 3 is often praised for its narrative, because it's all done through minimalistic elements that don't annoy the player by stopping the game dead. Environmental elements and brief character interactions are enough to provide the player with an understanding of the characters and the conflict that they are participating in. Anyway, back to Sonic Mania. Because you're constantly jumping around all these old zones with a few brand new ones sprinkled around, Mania doesn't really feel like you're on one big adventure towards Eggman's base. Titanic Monarch, the final level, just feels kind of weird anyway. Look at all this cool stuff in the background, and none of it really means anything or goes anywhere. We don't fight some giant robot or anything, instead we just fight this fairly decent Eggman boss and some refights with the hardballed heavies, and then another fight against Heavy King and Eggman which leads into... <laughs> Let's talk about the hard-boiled heavies real quick. I like them overall, and the designs are very interesting and appealing, but in terms of narrative, they're pretty much just as inconsequential as the Deadly Six from Sonic Lost World, as harsh as that may sound. Especially since you don't even need to actually fight any of them during the final boss, they just sort of show up and leave again, quite anticlimactically. I'll go over this in detail later on. Their motivations are quite unclear as well, since apparently they're supposed to be rebelling against Eggman, but they're also not? It's clear that Heavy King is fighting back during the 
final boss, but other than that, this isn't really mentioned anywhere in the game itself. I'd say Sonic 2 even has a more cohesive and clear narrative in a way, at the very least a clearer ending that feels much more satisfying, and a level progression that builds up from the starting green fields to more mechanical aesthetics later on. It doesn't help that these little ending cutscenes for Mania don't look anywhere near as good as the opening. They all look quite last minute, and they're also very compressed, but in terms of that video compression, the same can be said for the opening, so whatever. Look, I don't want to dwell on the lacking narrative elements of Mania too much, but since this is more of a critique and analysis than a normal review, I wanted to go deeper into elements of Sonic Mania that many people don't often address. I'll keep referring back to Sonic 3 throughout this video by the way, and yes this is going somewhere. Trust me. During the production of this review, I decided I should probably go back and do another Sonic & Tails All Emerald run of Sonic 3 Complete, because I haven't touched Sonic 3 since Mania came out, and it's quite critical to this analysis. I was surprised that out of everything, the 4x3 aspect ratio was the least jarring thing about going back to a pre-Taxman classic Sonic game. Instead, it was the lower frame rate on the animations and the slowdown every now and then that really tripped me up. I'd completely forgotten how the classic games used to just tank when Sonic got hit with too many rings and things like that, but I think I was also getting a little bit of input delay during my session. I played and recorded all of my Sonic 3 Complete run off the Steam version in order to be a bit more official instead of just using Kega Fusion to emulate it. For whatever reason, I was definitely getting significant stuttering at points, which was very frustrating, but whether it was input delay or not, something about Sonic did feel a little bit heavier compared to Mania. So let's talk about Mania then. Being a sequel to Sonic 3, it uses the same core moveset and mechanics, although the Insta Shield is not available normally. To make Mania more like Sonic 3 Complete's max control mode, I used a mod that enables the use of Sonic's brand new drop dash, along with the later unlockable Super Peelout and Insta Shield all at the same time. Normally, you can only have one enabled at a time, which is really lame. I have to admit, the drop dash really, really impressed me. You may recall me mentioning how much I would have rather just have the Insta Shield in my Month of Mania video last year, which to an extent is still true. But the drop dash has become such an essential part of Sonic's moveset that not having it back in Sonic 3 did actually mess with me a little bit. The drop dash doesn't kick in with the full speed of a fully revved spin dash, but it offers enough of a burst forwards to maintain Sonic's momentum after a jump, or to help him start back up again. It's just the right amount of speed so that it isn't abused over the normal spin dash, but not so little that it's completely worthless. I think part of why Sonic felt a bit heavier during my replay of 3 and K might have been the lack of drop dash. It really does afford the player a higher degree of control than before, especially in regards to changing directions or just maintaining speed. I hope this mechanic sticks around as a core element of classic Sonic design because it really is practical and fun to pull off. I mean, Forces kept it as well, so they must be intending to use it more in future. Now, I do want to go back to the Insta Shield real quick. I know most people won't use it since in the vanilla game it's only accessible via no save mode and it replaces the drop dash, but I want to talk about it anyway. It seems very inconsistent to me in Mania. Don't get me wrong, the Insta Shield hasn't always been perfect. It could shred through Orbanauts in launch base, but you'd still get hit by bubbles in Marble Garden, but for the most part, it did its job very well. Sonic's attack range was increased while also offering a split second of invincibility from enemy attacks. The flying battery miniboss is a particular standout, but in Mania, I feel since the whole game wasn't really designed for it, it doesn't always work. In general, I don't always feel that extra range as much as I would in Sonic 3. Some bosses cheat you out of insta-shield hits anyway. Look at the miniboss of Titanic Monarch, I'm clearly hitting it, but I guess it just wasn't programmed to allow me to. It's a shame, since the Insta Shield is a really great high skill ceiling move that sets Sonic apart from Tails and Knuckles. Oh, and speaking of which, those two are still the same, and they're both great. Tails can fly and swim, and Knuckles can glide and climb walls. I really wish they'd add Knuckles' wall spin dash from Sonic Advance 3 someday though. On the topic of Tails, in vanilla Sonic 3, you still needed a second controller to have Tails pick up Sonic and fly him around. Thankfully, Mania lets you do this just by holding up on the D-pad and jumping, which is a little bit finicky when you have the Super Peelout enabled, let alone a fire shield, but it's a really useful feature. Oh and yeah, elemental shields are finally back and they're all great. The combined ring from Knuckles Chaotix is here as well, which makes you drop a few larger rings of higher value instead of a large bunch that scatter everywhere. These are all really cool power-ups and I'm so glad to see them all back. Okay, last little issues with the controls now to do with the super transformations. I'll go into how you obtain them later and all the other little bits and pieces to do with them, but at launch, super transformations were the old not-so-faithful press-jump-twice method. Do you want to use the drop dash with 
Sonic, fly with tails or glide with knuckles? Well, I hope you like being stuck in a super form now. This actually meant a potential death with knuckles in his exclusive lava reef pathway, where you glide over a large pit and collect a lot of rings, probably enough to hit 50 for the super form threshold. You then need to glide to another wall, but if you hit that jump button again to initiate the glide, you're going to turn into super and fall to your death. I remember that happening to me on my first playthrough with knuckles. Thankfully, a patch came out which added a separate super button, which really should have just been there to begin with, but whatever. I wish it also functioned as a super cancel button, like in Sonic 3 Complete, but oh well. And on the topic of super forms, I use a mod that disables the supersonic music too. Not because I dislike it, but because I'd rather hear the normal stage and boss music. It's the same with Sonic 3 Complete, as I use the fast stage music option. I'll go over music later, but I mean, come on. Why would I rather listen to the one supersonic theme on loop when I could hear the entire rest of the soundtrack? Okay, now let's start looking into the meat and potatoes of Mania, the levels and the level design. I can say this right now, the level design in this game is, for the most part, excellent. It can vary though, and that's why I'm here talking about it for far too long in a YouTube video. This is the largest chunk of the video, so be ready. Sonic Mania is comprised of 12 zones, and of those 12 zones, 8 are returning from either Sonic 1, 2, CD, or 3 are Knuckles, and 4 are brand new, made exclusively for Mania. However, these new levels often borrow concepts from scrapped zones from earlier titles, with the best example being Mirage Saloon, which was inspired by Sonic 2's scrapped Dust Hill Zone, and Taxman's planned stage for his Sonic CD remake, Desert Dazzle. For the sake of convenience, order, and more thorough criticism, let's go through zone by zone, shall we? Green Hill Zone. Yep, it's back again. I remember being a bit annoyed by this after re-watching the Mania trailer after its initial unveiling, but I guess Sonic Team just needed to cram it in one more time. Starting a trend that will follow through the rest of the game's returning zones, Act 1 begins quite similar to the original, with a rather large stretch being basically one for one the same level as in Sonic 1. As the zone progresses, it starts to become a lot more vertical and open, while still retaining the wonderful slopes and loops the Green Hill is known for, and even including some corkscrews from Sonic 2's Emerald Hill. The mini boss is a cool take on the Wrecking Ball concept that hasn't really been done before, and it's insta-shield friendly too, which is nice. By the time we reach Act 2, the stage is underground and in the caves, and higher sections reveal mountains from beta builds of Sonic 1's Green Hill. Zip lines from Angel Island Zone become a core mechanic of this act, and while Act 2 shares some level geometry with the original Green Hill Act 3, it's basically an entirely new stage, starting another trend for the rest of the game's zones. It also introduces a super cool additional effect to one of the elemental shields. The fire shield is able to burn away the wooden spiked logs, which allows exploration to the lower areas of the stage. This is all super great stuff and just highlights how well the team managed to make these old zones feel as new as possible while still retaining the original aesthetics and ideas. The boss of this zone is a hybrid of runner-style bosses, introduced in Mushroom Hill in Sonic 3 and done to death in Advance 2, and well, the Death Egg robot from Sonic 2 itself. It's a pretty fun fight that allows for a lot of variety in terms of how you attack him, thanks to the utilization of slope terrain and additional higher platforms along the path. Having an elemental shield here with Sonic is also quite a big help, as the double jump abilities can allow you to hit the boss a lot easier. I've heard that it is possible to run out of level length during this fight, as the path doesn't go on forever, but since I don't suck at video games, I've never seen it for myself. That's a joke, by the way. After the fight, we follow Eggman underground as he angrily commands the heavies to pursue Sonic Sonic from now on, with a brilliantly smooth animation here to boot. It's a shame there aren't more little story moments like this in the game. This is just Green Hill Zone again, so I don't have as much to say about this compared to all the other zones in the game. It's good, it's fun, it's Green Hill, it's been done to death, let's move on. Chemical Plant Zone. Yeah, this one's back again as well. The level transition here is a little bit lame, the characters just kinda get warped here again by the Phantom Ruby, but hey, that's better than most of the later zones that don't have any transition at all. At least Sonic and Knuckles get this cool little animation at the start. Tails does have one as well, but it doesn't play in-game for whatever reason. Very odd. Act 1 of this zone is kind of a mix of the original Act 1 and 2, while mixing in a lot of elements from Metallic Madness from Sonic CD. Uh, more on that later down the zone order. The moving blocks the climb of death are still here, and yeah, they can lead to some unlucky deaths, I didn't manage to capture any in my footage, but I think the fact that you can skip the entire section is still very worth acknowledging. Also, a few famous secret spots from the original chemical plant that were used for one-up locations are now being used for special stage entrances, which is a really good touch for those familiar with the game. More on special stages and bonus rings and all that stuff later as well. The mini boss here is basically a redo of the ice cap mini boss and the metropolis zone boss, which is fine I guess. Doesn't seem to insta 
shield friendly, which furthers my idea about the attack hitbox not being as large in Mania, because it worked fine for this boss in Sky Sanctuary. Act 2 decides to keep some of the metallic madness elements, but then adopts some design from CD's wacky workbench with this super cool bouncy gel straight out of Aperture Science. In fact, the music for Act 2 of Chemical Plant even incorporates the metallic madness theme for a brief moment. <laughs> furthering the CD connection and, well, an issue I have with another zone in this game later on. This whole act has this awesome science lab theme with these super cool DNA helix launches and these sticky platforms and things. This is for sure one of the best returning acts in the game. It's a shame the level order had to go Green Hill, Chemical Plant again right after Generations, but the stage designs are so good that somehow I find myself not really minding. The boss of this act is a mean bean machine throwback, which don't get me wrong, I was freaking out over when I first saw this, but then I instantly thought to myself, this is going to be a bit of a pace breaker every place through now, isn't it? Yeah, it sort of is. It's a great gag the first time, and the fight isn't bad or anything, especially after so many playthroughs, but I'm sure a lot of people do get a bit sick of having to refight this every time. I'm just indifferent to it now. Studiopolis Zone. A better transition this time, and we've been brought to one of the greatest zones ever made for a Sonic game. This level is just the best. I'll go more in depth on the aesthetics later on in a different segment, but the idea of film studio and TV studio for Act 1 and Act 2 is just genius. This was the first zone showcase for the game for a damn good reason, as it's clear the team knew exactly what they wanted it to look and play like from very early on. It's got a bit of that bounce from Spring Yard, Casino Night, and Carnival Night, but in its own way. Hidden goodies are everywhere, and there's always some creative way to fling Sonic to a higher spot in the stage with the use of this zone's many slopes and bumpers. You're always moving, and there's always some cool new easter egg or portion of the stage to find after each playthrough. I don't really have too much to say here other than, it's really good you guys. The mini boss here with Heavy Gunner is fun, but it's far too long. It's another runner boss, except you're forced to wait to hit the boss, which is always annoying, especially in a Sonic game. I often find myself spending far more time playing this mini boss than I do playing the actual first act. This little animation on the transition to Act 2 is one of my favorite things in Mania, not even kidding. I remember getting a huge grin on my face when I saw it for the first time. Anyway, now the movie aesthetic is gone, and we're in a TV studio, complete with set lights, word quiz panels, and lotto machines. All of these details still impress me, I can't believe just how much polish went into this zone. There's a great sense of flow here, and the brief moments of automation through the chemical plant-esque tubes are fun, and I don't feel like the game is just playing itself for me. Now the boss here is an interesting one. The gimmick is great, it's a TV weather report and each of Eggman's attacks are dependent on different weather states sun, wind, or storms. If you time your jumps just right with Sonic or Tails, you can hit Eggman quite consistently and skip most of his patterns, and I'm okay with that. I know a lot of people say they prefer this boss as Knuckles, since his shorter jump means you need to actually fight the boss, in quotes. I understand that, but to me, my favorite Sonic bosses have always been the ones you can skip if you're skilled enough. Aquatic Ruin from Sonic 2 comes to mind, where you can stand on top of the pillars on the left or right of the screen to completely avoid the arrow gimmick entirely. This doesn't bother me at all because it rewards rewards players for thinking a little bit differently and using the skills of the characters to their advantage. For this boss in particular, I really like to be able to skip it, since some of his attacks don't really offer any openings and you just sort of have to keep waiting. Not a fan of that in Sonic games in general. Flying Battery Zone. Another neat transition to this one, further using the TV news station idea. The zone in general is probably one of the least original in terms of mechanics for returning stages. It shakes up the already established elements of Flying Battery from Sonic 3 really well, but it doesn't necessarily add anything crazy like Chemical Plant did, for example. It does have this really cool passive action for the electric shield though, making it magnetized to the electric ceilings that were present in the original zone, and allowing for anti-gravity platforming like in Death Egg Zone. There's also quite a few Wing Fortress elements thrown around later on in this zone as well. I do like the attempts to speed up certain sluggish elements of this stage, such as the rockets here from the original level, and the speed of the moving platforms, but I'd have preferred to just not have to wait for these at all, really. Some of the more fiddly mechanics of the original flying battery have thankfully been removed, such as the corkscrew looking elevators and the weird moving circular things. 
Act 1's mini-boss is probably one of my favorites in the game, relying on the player to use the Junk Badniks as a platform to reach the laser from the original Flying Battery. Act 2's gimmick is basically, hey, what if you went outside a bit more, and shifts the player between indoor and outdoor sections quite frequently, and this is where most of the Wing Fortress elements start appearing. The weather also changes from the bright sunny day to a stormy afternoon, which is a very welcome change. This act also uses the swinging poles quite a bit for various platforming scenarios, especially during these sections of breaking apart electrical systems that harken back to Sonic CD's wacky workbench. The boss of this zone is where I start having some more criticisms. This spider idea is really cool, and I like how it's foreshadowed at the mini-boss, but it's just too fiddly and buggy. This was the first part of my first run of the game that caused me to die several times, and it was because I didn't realize just how inconsistent this boss is to fight. In order to damage Eggman here, you need to hit the bumper on his mech with enough force to send him into the spike walls. Cool idea, but for some reason, half of the times I send him into the spikes, it doesn't damage him. Also, half of the times I try and hit the bumper, I just clip straight through it, which often causes me to take damage. Just look at how inconsistent some of these hits can be. Why does this hit land, but not this one? Also, sometimes using the poles to launch myself at him at full speed doesn't even send him moving very far. Why? This boss also has this annoying attack where he'll move really high up the screen so you can't hit him, and he'll shoot down some balls of electricity. You can basically stunlock Eggman to prevent him from ever doing this attack if you just keep whacking him though, which I think is quite nice. Again, this boss is a really cool idea, unfortunately in execution, some of the elements hold it back quite a bit. Press Garden Zone, another brand new zone for Mania, and it's also the first one to lack an actual stage transition. Just a fade to black and boom, now you're off this giant airship and in a completely different area. I know that complaining about level geography and zone transitions really isn't a huge component to the game, but my point is that all of these are smaller details that add up to make the game feel a lot more cohesive and enjoyable. There are also things that Sonic 3 & Knuckles got right over 20 years ago. It took me a while to realize that the first act of this zone was a printing press, specifically a a propaganda factory, which made a lot more sense when I thought of the zone being named Press Garden. I think it could have been communicated a little bit better if the background was easier to interpret, because at first I thought those stack of newspapers were some kind of train. Level design wise, this zone uses a lot of these weird conveyor belt launches, and I think they're pretty fun. There's also quite a bit of launch base zone thrown in here, what with the rotating tubes and even a few chunks of level design, such as this special stage ring being lifted right from launch base act 1. Owen oh, Splats the canned bunny rabbit badnik from Sonic 1 is here as an enemy. Well isn't that swell? The mini-boss here is an interesting idea, but a little bit too confusing. I didn't realize my first time that you needed to lure it into the orange boxes to stun it. I normally tend to just spam the insta-shield on my super forms to get past this one as quick as possible, to be honest. At least it's an original fight, I suppose. Now, Act 2 of Press Garden, though, mmm, this is damn good. Most people I've heard claim this to be their favorite new zone in the game just for this act. The press part of the zone is out, and now we're in the garden part of the zone, coated in ice and cherry blossoms. The ice the mechanic here can be a little bit confusing at first as well. For one thing, the machines that freeze you here are right out of ice cap zone, except this time they don't damage you, which is hard to notice at first. You're actually supposed to build momentum and fling yourself as a block of ice to get through certain level obstacles, which is a really cool idea once you understand it. I feel most players instinctively try to break out of the ice before they realize you're meant to use it to your advantage. This is another level where the fire shield gets some cool bonus effects, allowing you to melt through ice chunks instead of needing to smash through them with the ice block method. Some other nice little details I also enjoy about this zone are how temporary platforms are actually sideways asterons from Metropolis Zone if you look really closely. The boss of Press Garden might just be the best fight in the entire game. At the very least, it's certainly up there. Heavy Shinobi of the Hard Boiled Heavies offers an excellent one-on-one -on -one battle that feels fair and balanced. He can only be hit when he's in mid-air, because if you try and attack him on the ground, he'll freeze you into an ice block like earlier in the stage. While he jumps up in the air, he throws down asterons as shurikens that eventually explode like they did back in Sonic 2, sending out five small projectiles. There's a definite risk versus reward dynamic here. You can try and attack the heavy while he's in the air, but if you feel like you're going to miss, you could intentionally get yourself frozen to avoid any damage from the asterons, since you're invulnerable while in that state. It just means you won't be able to attack the heavy himself at that point, so you lose that advantage. This is the kind of dynamic boss design I would love to see more often in Sonic fights like this, where the enemy is essentially on the same level as the player, if that makes sense. It's more like a character battle instead of a big boss robot, but unlike the Knuckles fight in Sonic 3, it isn't painfully simple. More bosses like this for the eventual Mania sequel, please.
Stardust Speedway Zone. Since this level is from Sonic CD, which had a central focus on time travel, the zone transition here is a little confusing and makes the rest of the game even more confusing. So, Act 1 of Stardust Speedway is in the past, Act 2 is in the present. At the end of Press Garden, Eggman uses the Phantom Ruby to send Sonic to Little Planet for the stage, but does that mean he intentionally sent them back in time as well? I don't know why he would do that, but okay. This just raises questions about when and where all of this is happening though, but whatever. Act 1 has a lovely overgrown theme to it, with a lot of elements returning from Marble Garden Zone, mainly these ropes, wheels, and vertical corkscrews. There's also these launchers from Sandopolis, and these extending bridges from Mushroom Hill Zone. Focusing on how this stage builds upon the original, I feel it does a pretty good job at feeling unique. I'm still not really a fan of CD's love of bouncing you everywhere and these confusing tube sections, but thankfully this zone in Mania doesn't really do that too much. I love the usage of the end of zone magic plant capsules to create these vine platforms. That's an awesome mechanic, and the Back to the Future speed boosters are still present as well. Well, it's just that there's no real-time time travel mechanics in this stage, unlike in CD, so you can't leave a fire trail upon time traveling like you could back then hence the name. The mini-boss here is a giant version of the Hitaru Firefly Badniks from CD, but it also spawned the normal, smaller versions, with their attack patterns from the original boss in CD's final act of metallic madness. This fight is fine, it's quite short, it's simple, and it's very easy to understand. After the fight, this cool little time travel act transition launches you into the present version of Stardust Speedway, with one of the best looking levels in the whole game. I'll discuss aesthetics more at the end, but this level is just gorgeous, if a little visually busy. I love the spotlights in the foreground and the amazing purple tones against the golden brass instrument aesthetic everywhere else. Act 2 gets rid of a lot of the returning elements from Marble Garden and the like, and it has these awesome speed-based bungee cords from Sonic Advance 3 Sunset Hill of all places, and these super fun fireworks that launch you up really high and finish with a colourful bang. This is another great stage that unfortunately does feel like it can end a little bit too quickly. In fact, there's an achievement for beating this stage in under a minute, and no other stage has something like that, so I guess that says something. Then there's the Metal Sonic boss fight, which I went over earlier. Smashing the holograms that were hidden in the stages of CD is a good way to build up to his entrance with a great remix to boot. This fight is another take on the now famous Metal Sonic race from the original Stardust Speedway, which has been done many times now, but I feel this one is pretty good. There aren't any annoying spikes and blocks everywhere to get in the way, and Metal's attacks are telegraphed a bit more, with the widescreen certainly helping. The drop dash is also utilized to great effect during this fight to keep Sonic's speed going when jumping up and down onto different levels of terrain. Obviously Tails and Knuckles don't have this advantage, but that's just another reason why the drop dash helps make Sonic feel more unique. After this first phase of the fight, Metal Sonic plugs himself into into a machine reminiscent of his appearance in Knuckles Chaotix, and begins to spawn mini versions of Silver Sonic from the 8-bit version of Sonic 2 on the Game Gear and Master System. I remember freaking out when I first saw this, it was a pretty obscure callback, but it is a bit difficult to tell how you're supposed to fight back during this section. At first I just kept killing all the little Silver Sonics, until I realized that nothing in the fight was changing, and then I started to experiment. What you're meant to do is spin dash into the little robots while they are also spin dashing, in order to fling them into Metal Sonic. This can be a bit annoying with Super Forms though, since you hit the Silver Sonics way harder and further than normal, meaning sometimes they won't hit Metal Sonic at all and just bounce around everywhere. I found getting them in the corners first was the best way to consistently get hits when in a super state. After damaging Metal Sonic four times, the fight continues into another race segment, which then becomes a chase from a spiked wall. This section is painfully easy when in the super form, but also painfully annoying when played normally. I've gotten better at it as time has gone on, but hitting Metal more than once without bouncing back into the spikes is a bit of an ordeal. I feel the rubber banding on the spiked wall is a bit too strict, and the wiggle room between it and Metal Sonic should have been increased by a little bit. Anyway, as I said earlier, I do enjoy this fight, although I feel it goes on for a bit too long compared to all the other fights in the game. If it was built up and established that this was an important moment, then it would have been far more justified. Oh, and it's also worth noting that in my Knuckles run of this boss that I recorded, the music didn't load at all. Mania gets a few weird bugs like that sometimes, although thankfully they've mostly been patched out since release.
Hydro City Zone. Yes, it's pronounced Hydro City. Hydrocity is a cool gag on water and velocity, which makes sense, but it's Hydro City. Check the Japanese manual and stuff. Everyone's favorite water level is back. If you disagree with that, you're clearly objectively wrong. Putting my bias aside, I feel this may be one of the weaker returning zones, which is really unfortunate because it was one I really wanted to see back. Also, the music, especially for Act 2, is fantastic, albeit not that different from the original zone. I think the problem is that the new additions to the stage actively slow down the pace, with waiting around on the boats, pulling switches to raise and lower the water levels, and floating around in a bubble akin to Sonic Triple Trouble on the Game Gear. These are all new additions to the zone, but they don't feel very fun to use because you're always slowing down to interact with them. This is on top of the reasonably slowly moving pillar platforms and fans that were already present in the original Hydro City Zone. The mini-boss of the zone is one of the better callbacks in the game, however. Eggman is swimming around in scuba gear planting bombs, and after a brief escape sequence akin to Labyrinth and Marble Garden, you get to pilot the boss mech from the original Hydro City Act 2 boss and turn the tables around. This is fun even if you haven't played Sonic 3 before, but obviously the effect is strengthened for longtime fans like myself. I don't think I've ever gotten hit once during this fight, but it's fun and it's silly and I love it. Act 2 likes to use a lot more of Hydro City's famous ramps and water running sequences, but I also caught quite a few times here where it reused level chunks from the original acts, which is odd for an Act 2 stage in this game, as they're usually completely new. The boss of Act 2, however, is one of the best in the game, I feel. It uses the rushing water as an actual mechanic far more than before, although I must say again that this fight is a bit easy in my eyes. Not a fan of the reuse of Hydro City's mini-boss, though, because this just sort of feels like padding. It hurts especially that it's been modified to be harder to hit, with the boss pillar higher than in the original game, making it more difficult to spam hits. I think if they're going to reuse this mini-boss, it should have started with it, but with the same properties as the original. Then it acts as a bit of a fake-out when the player gets sucked into the rushing water section and fights the actual main boss. Maybe add some additional challenges to this part of the fight instead, and I feel this boss would have benefited greatly. Mirage Saloon Zone. Again, no transition, and this one is probably one of the most jarring. We go from Hydro City on Angel Island to all three of the main characters together on the tornado just flying? When was it stated that they were all together? Knuckles was off on his own when the heavies escaped with the Phantom Ruby. Since Sonic Story is the canon one, there's no sign of Knuckles until this point in the game if you're playing Sonic Story, and it's very odd. Anyway, don't get too used to it, because Knuckles disappears after two seconds of screen time to go and have his own original stage from Mirage Saloon Act 1. Actually, he's getting the better deal there, because this Sky Chase callback is unnecessary and a bit annoying. The train part and mini-boss later are cool, although I had a pretty lame death at one point on the train, but this whole first act is just a drag. The Knuckles original stage is pretty great though. It's designed specifically to cater towards climbing and gliding, along with breaking walls that Sonic and Tails cannot. The seesaws from Starlight Zone and Hilltop make a return as well. Oh, and there's a particular mod that I often use when doing Knuckles runs in Mania, and that's the Oh No mod. Oh no! It's pretty self-explanatory. But in this one act, there's an amazing little bonus that I always forget about until I get here, and I love it more and more each time. Knuckles boss for this act is actually a redo of the Gigaopolis boss from Sonic Chaos of all things. Not going to lie, I did not pick that one up on my first go. Part of that is probably because I've never fully beaten any of the Game Gear or Master System Sonic games. Maybe I will someday if I hate myself. Sonic and Tails have this little trip over the train, which is probably just here to provide a checkpoint, and then they fight the giant caterpillar boss up in the air. I really wish the train sequence was longer and actually a full area for an act instead of the Sky Chase segment, but oh well. I just really like trains. The depth perception in the Sonic version of this fight can be a touch tricky, but this fight isn't really that hard. Probably more difficult than most of the other mini-bosses in the game, simply because of the vague opportunities to hit the weak spot. After this fight, Sonic and Tails are shot down by one of the three members of Team Hooligan, either Fang slash Knack, Bean, or Bark and land down on the sands of Act 2. This is one of the best acts in the entire game for sure, but once again, I feel it's a touch too short. I love the aesthetic here, with this new zone basically being an official implementation of Sonic 2's Scrap Dust Hill Zone and Taxman's Scrap Desert Dazzle for Sonic CD. Sure, it's a desert level, but they made it bright and colorful and fun. 
The actual saloon part is key to this with the bar stools, barrels and paintings offering some further visual flair. The egg Celsior devices are worth mentioning for offering some cool speed and timing based moments. And the giant egg robo blasters are a great addition for fleeing the characters around the place. Also these giant piano key things just remind me of the Simpsons. Speaking of music, this may be Tilo's best original track for the game. This is such a jam. Heavy Magician is an interesting fight, because it's revealed that the returning hooligans are actually illusions formed by her magic, and she transforms between the three during the fight in an underground theatre. This is a cool idea and a pretty fun fight, but unfortunately the frame data on her transformations can cause some cheap hits on the player. When the Heavy transforms, her attack hitbox is active to the player, but the player cannot attack her, not even bounce off without damaging her or the transformations. This means you can go for a hit and get kind of unfairly damaged as a result because you need to wait a predetermined amount of time before the damage hitbox activates. I'm not saying this is a huge problem or that the boss is really that hard, it's just an issue that I have with it. Especially when she changes to Fang slash Knack, I find avoiding the bullets to be a bit tricky since she can fire the moment she transforms. Bean's bombs can be a little bit annoying as well. I don't think I've ever seen Barks attack until this recording is Knuckles, to be honest, let alone been hit by it. Oil Ocean Zone. An odd choice for a returning Sonic 2 zone, since this is normally a lot of people's least favourite from what I understand. I personally would have preferred Mystic Cave, but I'm preaching to the choir, I think everyone agrees with that. At least there's an actual zone transition this time. I will say that overall, I feel this is an improvement over the original Oil Ocean, mainly due to the enemy placement. The original zone had a lot of moments where you'd get blindsided by the seahorse badniks, but thanks to the widescreen, and I assume just different enemy behaviour, I feel this doesn't really happen anymore in Sonic Mania. Elemental shield's deflecting projectiles certainly helps with this too. Another point for the fire shield goes to this zone for letting you set all of the oil on fire, which I distinctly remember put a smile on my face the first time I played. There isn't really too much different stuff in this zone, and to be honest, this is where the game starts to dip in terms of zone quality for me. From this point onwards, most of the stages don't feel quite as good as all of the ones beforehand, which is a real shame because it makes the final stretch feel like a bit of a slog. I'm not saying the zones towards the end are bad, they just aren't as fun as the first eight. Anyway, the mini boss here kind of sucks. It's either way too easy, so easy you may never even see his attacks, or way too cheap, when he lifts you into the air and you get crushed by spikes that were off screen. Not a very fair boss hazard, which is odd because even the classic games didn't resort to this level of unfairness. After this fight, the entire oil refinery starts to go up in flames, leaking deadly gas everywhere. After a while, this gas will start to eat away at your ring count, and the only way to make it temporarily go away is another returning mechanic. The pulleys from Sandopolis Zone Act 2. So now it's most people's least favourite zone of Sonic 2, meshed with the definitive low point of Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Why? Nobody likes Sandopolis, especially Act 2. Everyone hates that stage, it's always referred to as the worst part of Sonic 3. I'm not even saying Oil Ocean Act 2 is a straight up bad level because of this. No, it's fine. But just, why? I'll give them credit and say that the deadly gas isn't anywhere near as bad as the ghosts in Sandopolis, but still, this is a very strange addition. The new submarine mechanic is a cool touch for Act 2 as well, but I feel it breaks the pace too much, just like the new elements in Hydro City. You have to really slowly enter this isolated little area to grab maybe a few bits and pieces and break some bad nicks, then hop right out where you came. Maybe if the submarine acted as entrances to other full parts of the stage or something, I'd be more inclined to use them, but most of the time I just tend to skip them. I know the boss of this zone is one a lot of people had serious trouble with on their first playthroughs. I remember dying a few times, but I never got enough for a game over. For that matter, I've never game overed in Mania in general, so I don't even know what the screen looks like if you do so. This fight is essentially the original Oil Ocean boss, just with the tentacles from Lava Reef's mini boss added on top. This just makes the fight feel a bit more fiddly and doesn't really improve on it from the original battle in Sonic 2. I would have rathered a more creative new boss instead. Well, I could say that for most of Mania's bosses and level choices, but hey, they're still all good. Lava Reef Zone. No transition. Again. In fact, all of these last few stages lack transitions, unless you're playing as Knuckles, and even then, his is pretty simple, but that's for later. I feel this returning level is roughly just as good as the original, maybe a little bit better in some ways. I still don't really like having to push these buttons to open the doors most of the time. Some of them are harmless, others just feel a little bit unnecessary and slow the stage down just enough for it to be annoying. The returning Rexon badniks from Hilltop are pretty cool, but I've found the hit detection of their heads to be just a little 
little bit off in Mania. I don't know, I just feel like whenever I try to bounce off their heads, I'm always taking a bath in the lava, when that was never a problem for me in Sonic 2. This weird moving platform thing from Metallic Madness is back again as well, but it's used for some alright platforming in Act 2. I really enjoy how Act 1 shows how Lava Reef has seemingly had some work done in it, with chain link fences and further construction elements resembling a mine network being added. Even the loops are used from Sonic 3's multiplayer stage Endless Mine, so it's clearly on purpose. I love in the later part of the stage when you get to see the volcanoes and caves stretched out into the distance, it's such a nice vista. In Act 2 you can also see Little Planet in the distance, which I suppose makes sense for later, but at this point in the game no geography has been established. Is Angel Island right next to Little Planet now? Moving on. The mini boss here is another of one of the more confusing ones. I had no idea you were supposed to wait for the mech's external armor to break before you could safely attack it. I'll say it again, I don't think Sonic bosses work well when you're required to wait for an opening for so long. It contrasts against the rest of the game in which you're not always moving at blazing speeds, but you're always in control and are always moving. Very rarely do you ever need to wait for a moving platform or anything in Mania, at least if you're skilled enough. So whenever you are just forced to wait it out, it does feel a little bit strange. This boss also does the Mystic Cave thing of dropping debris all over the ground from above, so that's a thing. I don't know, I've just been mentioning a lot of the returning elements from past games and I figured I should say that for this one. Just like the original Lava Reef, Act 2 enters a much cooler area, comprised of glowing rocks and mining equipment on the way to Hidden Palace. The switchable conveyor belts from Sonic CD's Quartz Quadrant make an appearance here, and I think they're quite a welcome addition since they fit with the crystallized mine look. Now I never really enjoyed the slow moving platforms in the original Lava Reef, or the flamethrowers in the walls, and I still don't really like them that much here. Again, none of these are outright bad, they just force you to slow down a lot most of the time. If anything, out of these last four stages I think Lava Reef is the best one. Knuckles has some great alternate routes throughout this stage, including his own unique boss and end of level location. While Sonic and Tails take the higher route to see the starry night sky and face against Heavy Rider, Knuckles takes the lower route to Hidden Palace and fights against Heavy King as he attempts to steal the Master Emerald. This is a fun battle and harkens back to Eggman's betrayal of Knuckles in Sonic 3, and Knuckles' fight against Mecha Sonic. Interestingly enough, this also acts as justification for why the Super Emeralds aren't unlockable in the game, due to them being cracked and drained of energy. Don't have much to say besides, yeah, this is a really good fight. Sonic's fight is quite good too, but the hitbox on Heavy Rider isn't easy to land on due to the Moto Bug getting in the way, not to mention her spinning ball and chain above her head. This means you have to deliberately jump as low as you can, which is admittedly an interesting challenge for a Sonic boss. Metallic Madness Zone. Sonic and Tails don't get any kind of transition here, but Knuckles at least gets to use the teleporter from Hidden Palace and Sky Sanctuary to warp into this zone. I'm gonna say this now, I think this is the worst level in the game. It's sort of paradoxical though, because I love the music, but who the hell was asking for this stage to come back? It's already been used and referenced in previous levels multiple times, as I mentioned earlier. Also, Sonic CD had Metallic Madness right after Stardust Speedway, so why didn't Sonic just come here after he beat Metal Sonic several zones ago. I know this is sort of nitpicky, in fact it's very nitpicky, but these are all the little nagging issues with Mania that could have been addressed had it not been rushed to some extent, or if Sonic Team had let Christian Whitehead achieve his original vision of a brand new Sonic game instead of something more akin to Generations again. Anyway, let's talk about the actual level design and why I don't like it. For me, this stage is far too chunky and awkward to navigate, with springs placed everywhere for the sole purpose of annoying you and sending you back to where you've already been. I do really like the going into the background mechanic though, that's pretty cool. The colour scheme of the background elements compared to the foreground is actually borrowing from different timelines of the original stage in CD, which is a cool touch. This is also the zone in the game where they decided to start getting a bit more obnoxious with spikes, especially hidden spikes. Previous Sonic games have used these a lot, but Mania thankfully uses them quite sparingly. Metallic Madness does have a little bit of a fondness for them though, and boy that's just great. These lowering spike platforms were not something I wanted to see come back from the original game, but at least you can skip them with Tails. These Bomb enemies were another thing I didn't want to see come back either, and I still don't like them here. You just have to sit around and wait to get past them, or tank the hits and just run. Oh, and these weird umbrella looking enemies aren't the worst thing in the world, but I still don't really like them either. The shrinking mechanic is back too, where Sonic and friends get super small and navigate specifically designed platforming sections. These never really did anything for me to be honest, but they're at least not as bad as the other annoying elements I just mentioned. And then there's Act 2's switching layer mechanic, which again, never really did anything for me back in CD. Basically my problem with this entire zone is that it's borrowing ideas from an already pretty lame Sonic CD level that I didn't want to see come back. The mini boss is a redo of Final Zone from Sonic 1 for some reason, but the Act 2 boss is pretty good. You have to fight an Eggman mech with striking similarities to Botanic Base's box from Knuckles Chaotix, 
I haven't really touched Chaotix myself, so that one goes to Sonic Retro, except it functions like a gumball machine dropping mini versions of past mechs, specifically Marble Zone's boss, Emerald Hill's boss, and a robotic version of Amy that resembles her appearance in Palm Tree Panic, and also the Tails doll. She also acts as a suicide bomb, so that's pretty cool. This is a nice fight that lets you play at your own pace, since the mini enemies only appear when you jump and turn the wheel on Eggman's mech. I'll say this again though, as much as I'm not a fan of this level, I need to stress it isn't bad. It's certainly better than the original Metallic Madness, which was a nightmare to navigate. The only thing that stops me from going all out on this stage though is T Lope's killer remixes of the Metallic Madness theme. It was already a favorite of mine in CD, and these two tracks cement that for me. Act 1's Ghostbusters remix is pretty damn good. And Act 2's saxophone remix is my jam! Titanic Monarch Zone. No transition again, but you get the picture by now. This is Mania's final zone, and it's the last brand new one too. And it's probably the weakest new stage, which is a shame because it's the final level and you should leave a bit more of a kick, you know? Death Egg from 3 and K is still a great example of this if you ask me. Anyway, so I have some questions now. Titanic Monarch is clearly on Little Planet. Lava Reef showed it in the background. The next zone was Metallic Madness, which was on Little Planet, and now we're here. And the ending cutscene shows that yes, this is on Little Planet. My question is, why? Why is Little Planet back? Why is Eggman's base on it? Why is it chained to the planet again? Are we in the past? Are we in the future? We've time traveled at least once or twice so far, so who even knows? What is Eggman's plan in this game? In Sonic 2, it was obvious. He wanted to launch the Death Egg. In Sonic 3, that was it again. He wanted to launch the Death Egg again and have it working this time. To be fair, he almost did. In Mania, it's just he wants the Phantom Ruby because it has power, I guess? But what does he want it for? Sure, you could say to beat Sonic, but how? At least the Death Egg is a pretty obvious problem. It's a giant space station loaded with weapons and lasers that could probably destroy the planet. But we're never shown how Eggman plans on using the Phantom Ruby to beat Sonic. Well, not in this game anyway. So this stage kind of annoys me in more ways than just why is it on Little Planet and stuff like that. During Act 1, we get all these cool backgrounds of cities and this giant version of the Heavy King, but nothing ever really happens with it. I think the idea is meant to be Act 1 is outside the base, which looks like this according to the ending cutscenes, and Act 2 is inside the base, which makes sense I guess, but if you show me this massive imposing figure of what is essentially the main villain of the game in the background, I kind of expect that to go somewhere? In terms of the actual stage design, I do really love the incorporation of the rotating spheres from Sonic 3's bonus stages as platform forming elements. There's also a lot of Metropolis Zone bumpers and, unfortunately, a lot more hidden spikes which aren't really ever very fun, especially when they catch you off guard. These little crash test dummy egg robos are fun, but isn't this base meant to be finished? Wouldn't this visual gag work better in a still under construction base? Okay, even I admit that is super nitpicky, but hey, I wanted to mention it. The miniboss here begins as a redo of Death Egg Zone's miniboss, but then shifts into this quite creative elevator section. Unfortunately, the game cheats here with the Insta Shield, as I mentioned earlier, so that's lame and Knuckles can have a pretty hard time waiting for a good moment to attack. Other than that though, the idea of timing your jumps based on the gravity and inertia of a moving elevator is a clever idea for a Sonic boss, so this fight definitely deserves my higher than average praise for this game. Riding the elevator to the top, we enter the base for Act 2, which follows some very untraditional Sonic level design. I do enjoy the cables and weird machines everywhere during this stage, but it adopts an odd pick-a-pathway non-linear design. I don't think this is bad or anything, I just don't get the feeling of infiltrating the final boss lair when I'm being teleported everywhere and completing various out-of-order, isolated challenges, only for a portal to eventually appear and take me to the final fight. There's a lack of geography, just like when you're warping around all the different zones in Mania with no proper transition. I actually have an idea on how this could have been handled so much better, but I'll touch on that in a moment. I've got to admit, I think Titanic Monarch may be my least favorite zone of the game in terms of music as well. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy it while I'm playing the game, I just have no desire to ever listen to it when I'm going through the soundtrack on my phone or my computer. I I really like the ominous feeling of Act 2 combined with the dial-up phone sounds, but again, it isn't really a piece of music I want to listen to on its own, unlike the rest of the soundtrack. Okay, so once you've cleared these four sections of Act 2 in whatever order you please, a portal opens and warps you to the final boss area. According to Sonic Retro, this is the Phantom Egg, which I suppose is due to the Phantom Ruby being right there in the middle of Eggman's mech. I get a very Sonic CD vibe from this fight, and immediately on my first playthrough, I wondered if it reused any mechanics from CD's scrapped final boss, and Taxman's final 
Primal Fever. Well, Sonic Retro says so, so that's fine by me. This is honestly a strange fight because it can go so many different ways. Your goal is to hit Eggman when he's vulnerable so you can sever these four electric cables off his mech and destroy Titanic Monarch by extension, somehow. Hey, I won't question it, the Death Egg blew up in Sonic 2 and 3 just because Sonic destroyed their respective bosses, so whatever. The thing is that here, Eggman's mech only really has two forms of attack, and they're both quite simple. He jumps with the shield on, only turning it off when he activates the electric coils. This means his only weak spot is also the easiest time for you to get hit, which is a nice challenge. The problem is that once you sever off at least one or two of the cables, the fight's basically won already. You only really need to be worrying about the two bottom cables, since they're on the ground where you're standing, and make it harder to reach Eggman when he activates them. Once they're gone though, you've got a pretty massive window for attacking him. Eggman will also occasionally launch a series of missiles down onto the ground, but again, they're easy to avoid. This is where things get a bit more interesting though. After a while, Eggman will summon these giant hands, which the player is essentially forced to jump into. These will transport them to an isolated rematch against each of the hard-boiled heavies in the same order that they were fought in during the main campaign. The fights themselves are completely different, but they're also not, well, fights. You don't have to fight any of them at all, and I mean that in two ways. For one, each fight with them is really just on a timer. You avoid their attacks and there's no point bothering to hit back because you get warped back to Eggman after a specific amount of time. This means I can just sit in the corner during these fights to avoid putting myself at risk. Holy crap though, did you see that insta shield I pulled off against Heavy Shinobi? That's why I love this move, mmm, so good. The second reason I say you don't have to fight any of these is that if you're quick enough, you can slam through Eggman's pattern before he even gets the chance to spawn the hands. While this is most efficiently performed in a super state, it isn't even needed. I did it just as normal Sonic during my run while recording footage for this video. It's quite ridiculous. What this means, as I said earlier in the video, is that the hard-boiled heavies don't really get a proper send-off as villains. Just like the Deadly Six in Sonic Lost World, they're there and then they just sort of disappear. If anything, they have less presence than the Deadly Six did because at least they had two bosses per zone, dialogue, and cutscenes to further their connection to the player. Now, this is where I have my own idea on how this could have been done way better. Okay, so in the room before Eggman with the four portals, there's a large stained glass window of all the hard-boiled heavies. There are five heavies with the king in the middle, meaning there are four normal heavies. What I think could have made the heavies far more compelling and memorable as bosses would be if each of these four portals were a gateway to a short platforming section followed by a fight with the corresponding heavy. Each platforming section could be themed after the heavy you were about to fight based on their bosses earlier in the game. When you return to the main portal room, the glass depiction of the heavy you just destroyed would be cracked and smashed. This would end with only the heavy king's portrait remaining before you go to fight Eggman with all of the the others smashed, building tension for the final fight with the king. I feel that this method would have made the heavies way more memorable during the final moments of the game. Maybe have a remix of high spec Robo Go from their respective bosses earlier in the game but amped up and more intense. Now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure Sonic Lost World actually did something like this during Lava Mountain, hey? Well, what do you know? So after this boss with Eggman, the game ends here for Tails and Knuckles. Well, there is a way to keep going as Knuckles in no save mode with the unlockable Knuckles and Knuckles mode, but that's beside the point. The Phantom Ruby warps Sonic and Eggman into a strange pocket dimension where Heavy King steals the ruby for himself. Eggman tries to snatch it back, but gets warped away? I don't know. The seven Chaos Emeralds orbit around Sonic as he transforms into a super form, launching himself at Heavy King. Egg Reverie. So this is Sonic Mania's supersonic only final boss, and it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I'm very glad it's not just Doomsday Zone again, but at the same time, it's not as good as Doomsday, which wasn't perfect to begin with. The core idea of this fight is that Eggman and Heavy King are fighting over the Phantom Ruby, and each time you attack one of them, they drop the gem, and the other comes back to pick it up. It's a 16-hit fight in total, with 8 hits on each enemy. This would be fine if the fight wasn't just the same patterns over and over again. You see, Doomsday Zone started with this asteroid-dodging chase section, which gave you time to build your ring count, since even though Supersonic is invincible, he loses one ring per second. Then you reach this part where you need to redirect the missiles back into Eggman's mech, which is quite challenging, and there aren't any more rings for you to collect. After this, Eggman's last ditch effort is to take the Master Emerald and book it, and now it's one last big chase through an asteroid field, grabbing rings and avoiding Eggman's bombs that slow you down. It's a fun progression that builds in intensity and changes the way you play with each little phase. Not perfect, but an enjoyable and satisfying final fight. With Egg Reverie, it's literally just the same thing over and over. I think Heavy King may increase the number of attacks that he sends out later on, but that's about it. He has these annoying energy shield things, which are also seen in Knuckles' boss fight at Hidden Palace, and for some reason they actually make Supersonic lose rings, which I don't really like. The only way to regain rings in this fight is to grab the few floating around the place, but thankfully there is a magnetism effect to draw them in easier. 
This does mean the fight is quite frantic, which adds to the intensity, so I do enjoy this aspect of it. You can also transition from flying to actually walking down on the ground and jumping like normal Sonic, or Super Sonic in a regular stage, and I think in some ways this is the easier method of winning the fight. You can get right under the bosses and just smack them the moment they get too close, instead of using the slipperier flight movement. While flying, Super Sonic does have a boost move, but it also drains rings, so I hardly ever use it. There isn't really much reason to use it anyway unless you're trying to bypass Eggman's annoying non-attack where he just pushes you away. It's for this reason that Heavy King is clearly the bigger threat in this fight, as he can actually drain your rings quite easily, whereas Eggman just shoves you all over the place. It's annoying, but you're not dying to him anytime soon. Now again, I must ask, what is happening during this fight? What is Eggman's goal right now? What is the Heavy King's goal? Why does he want the ruby over Eggman? What does Eggman want the ruby for? When the fight's over, the ruby creates a new portal, seemingly with the power of the Chaos Emeralds. It scatters them off and sends itself and Sonic into the portal. Everyone knows at this point that this was an obvious time into classic Sonic's forced inclusion to Sonic Forces. And yes, the final boss theme does have the chorus of Fist Bump in it, but thankfully without any lyrics. The thing is though, this happens when the Ruby is out of Eggman's control. If we thought his plan was to send Sonic to Forces, or just some alternate dimension, that can't be right, because this wasn't his doing. This was the Ruby, and I assume the Chaos Emeralds, doing their own thing. So let me ask again, what was Eggman's plan in this game? I have no clue. I feel like the Ruby thing may have been added in reasonably late in development from Sonic Team, and any other warp-related stuff in the game was done with Time Stones instead, since Little Planet plays a large role in the game. Speaking of which, I guess it's time to go over the ending. Titanic Monarch explodes and Tails and Knuckles have escaped back to the surface of their world. The chain on Little Planet snaps and it returns back to space as normal. We get a brief look at Sonic's trip through time and space, and get a little end card. This ending is underwhelming, sadly. There isn't really any narrative or thematic closure because we still have no idea what the actual story is. Was Knuckles supposed to be with Sonic the whole game? We certainly didn't see him anywhere except for two seconds in Mirage Saloon. As I said earlier, these ending animations are pretty lazy looking, especially compared to the opening, which is a shame. Wow, okay, that's all of Mania's zones done. I was not expecting to talk that much about each one, but here we are. I want to stress that in general, Mania's level design is fantastic. Every stage uses slopes and loops and springs to keep Sonic moving in a way that's compelling and interactive to the player. Momentum is such a huge part of all of these stages that there was no reason for me to bring it up when talking about each one individually because it applies to all of them. Some levels are worse than others, with Metallic Madness coming to mind, and some stages are more linear than others, namely Titanic Mars. But overall, this is the most consistently good set of Sonic zones across any of the games, I feel. Sonic 3 is great, but Sandopolis is such a huge drop compared to everything else that it's not as consistent, I feel. I will say that after analyzing all these stages and seeing how many times I needed to write this boss is returning from a past game, I do wish some of the bosses were a bit more inventive. Sonic 3 always kept you on your toes with the bosses, sometimes hyping them up all the way through a zone like an Angel Island or Marble Garden, or playing with your expectations like Mushroom Hill and Flying Battery. Anyway, there are two more big components to Mania's core gameplay that I still need to address, special stages and bonus stages. Okay, so every classic Sonic game did special stages differently up until Sonic 3 where they got it perfectly right. No more 50 rings at the end of a stage or 50 rings in a star post, you just explore the levels and find yourself a free entrance to a special stage. Simple, easy to access and understand, and it encourages exploration in such a great way. Sonic 3 had Blue Sphere for its special stages, which have always been my favorite from any Sonic game. They're simple yet challenging, if a little disorienting at first. Blue Sphere returns once again in Mania, and in glorious widescreen with superior animation but not as the main special stage. No, Blue Sphere is a bonus stage in Mania, which were those little mini-games in Sonic 3 you could access from a star post when you had enough rings. These mini-games served as an optional bonus that allowed you to get more rings, shields, and extra lives, and I really enjoyed them. But in Mania, that's all Blue Sphere now, when you have 25 rings or more and jump into a checkpoint. For the record, I am using a mod for Mania that replaces the default lamp post checkpoints from Sonic 1 and CD with the star posts from Sonic 2 and 3. I've always preferred these checkpoints, and since there are more levels from Sonic 2 and onwards in this game than 1 in CD, I figure the star posts are way more appropriate. The point here is that Mania has a bunch of new and returning Blue Sphere stages for you to complete. Since this is a bonus stage, this is not how you get the Chaos Emeralds. Instead, this is how you unlock various extra features for the game, such as the Insta Shield and Super Peel Out that I mentioned earlier, but also things such as a Mean Bean Mode, the DA Garden, and stuff like that. This is a great way to encourage unlocking extra features. The problem though is that once you've unlocked everything, there is 
is absolutely no benefit whatsoever to playing Blue Sphere ever again during a normal playthrough. You don't get rings or shields or extra lives from it, only the silver and gold medallions used for unlocking extras, and that sort of sucks. Bonus stages were a little fun extra in Sonic 3, and in Mania, they're still a fun little extra, but only for a short time, and only for rewards that exist outside of your current playthrough. Even if you did all of Blue Sphere in one run of Sonic Mania, none of these rewards from 32 stages of bonus stages mean anything until you exit to the main menu, which means there isn't really a meaningful impact gained from them. There is an all new randomly generated Blue Sphere mode as an unlockable extra as well, which uses green and pink spheres from Taxman and Stealth Sonic 3 proof of concept, but again, these don't get you anything, they're just an extra. So let's talk about the actual special stages now. Mania follows strong on the back of Sonic 3 with the giant hidden rings as entrances to special stages which made me extremely happy pre-release. I was so worried we'd go back to the end of level rings like in Sonic 4 or something dumb like that, but no, these guys knew what they were doing. Some of these rings are hidden in quite clever spots, as I've discovered throughout some of the levels mentioned earlier, and if you're good enough, you can have all the Chaos Emeralds by the end of Chemical Plant or early Studiopolis, which is about as quick as you could get them in Sonic 3. The difference, however, is that halfway through Sonic 3, you had seven more special stages to beat in order to grab the Super Emeralds, which does mean that Mania is a lot more front-loaded with special stage content in a way, but that doesn't really bother me. I didn't get all the Emeralds on my first run until after I beat the final boss. The actual special stage of Mania is called Dimension Heist, in which the Chaos Emerald is being held captive by a UFO. Drawing on elements from Sonic CD's 3D UFO special stages and Sonic 3's Blue Sphere, the player must chase down the UFO in order to steal the Emerald. You start off pretty slow and with 25 rings, which tick down one per second, acting as your timer. In order to catch up to the UFO, you have to keep collecting Blue Spheres to fill up Sonic's Mach speed gauge and reach a maximum of Mach 3, while also collecting rings to avoid running out of time. These are probably now my new favourite special stages in Sonic, I really love these so much. There are shortcuts around corners to catch up to the UFO faster, and item boxes in the air for some risk versus reward platforming, and it's just great stuff all around. The controls can be a bit slippery and hard to get used to at first, since Sonic and Pals have a bit of a drift-like mindset around turns. They also slow down quite significantly while jumping, which can be useful in some instances for making turns, but also annoying when needing to cross multiple rows of spikes and other obstacles. One thing I did find really obnoxious on my first playthrough were the bumpers on the side of the paths of the special stages. These keep you from falling off the side, so hey, cool, that's nice, but you can't jump over them either, despite there being no indicator for this whatsoever. I assume this is to prevent players falling off stages really early on, or from skipping corners constantly, but some kind of visual representation of that idea would be nice, because as it is now, Sonic just bounces off an invisible wall whenever you try to jump over one of these. I should mention as well, I've had a couple times in past playthroughs where I've accidentally gone so fast in the early special stages that I overshot the UFO and was in front of it. All I could do was smack into a wall for a while until it went in front of me again. Not a huge problem, but just something I felt was worth mentioning. I want to quickly mention as well that I really love the Sega Saturn aesthetic for these stages. The low poly models combined with terrain that reminds me of F-Zero and the like is a really, really nice touch. Same as ever, once you've got all seven Chaos Emeralds, you've got your super form. Tails actually gets one this time as well, it's just that he doesn't need the super emeralds to activate it. To balance this, however, he doesn't have his flicky army of death, which makes sense. Super Sonic and Super Knuckles are basically the exact same from 3 and K, except they have their hyper after images incorporated now. I guess since the hyper forms weren't included in the game, the team just decided to use some elements to balance it out for those who really wanted them to come back. I'm not really affected at all by the lack of Hyper Sonic and Hyper Knuckles, it doesn't really bother me. I agree that Sonic doesn't need a billion different transformations like Dragon Ball Z, but it was a cool extra thing for Sonic 3. It won't bother me if they do come back one day, but it also won't bother me if they don't. Since I mentioned aesthetics before, let's talk about them. I've gone over every zone, boss, and bonus stage now, so don't worry, I'm nearly done here. Sonic Mania looks absolutely gorgeous. This is easily the best looking 2D Sonic game ever, and has set a new standard for future sprite-based video games to follow. For one thing, this is one of the few modern throwback games that decided to go for 16 and 32-bit aesthetics and not 8-bit NES stuff again. I love Shovel Knight and Mega Man 9, for example, but so many games try to play to the 8-bit nostalgia, and it's just so tired now. Besides, I always thought the 16-bit era was way better. Sonic 2, Sonic 3, Super Mario World, Mega Man X, Super Metroid, all that stuff. 
The core aesthetic idea behind Mania, according to Christian Whitehead himself, was what if a classic Sonic game was released on the Sega Saturn, which I think is a brilliant idea. Now, obviously a new Sonic game back then wouldn't have had two thirds of its stages being returning ones from previous games, nor be in widescreen, but that's not important here. The game's art direction was meant to emulate the advances in 2D sprite quality from 32-bit hardware, since Sonic never saw a 2D release on the Saturn during the mid-90s, and it paid off in spades. I mean, the new stuff looks incredible, but it's the returning assets where it's most noticeable. Just look at how many frames of animation all the characters have. The elemental shields are so alive, I could marvel at that bubble shield all day long. And that new flame shield dash looks so much stronger and faster now. Look at how much smoother this climbing animation is and flying battery. Oh, and see how the tornado tilts up and down in perspective when it moves? Oh, that's so cool. And these backgrounds are just so rich and colorful, it blows me away every time. Major points to Studiopolis, Press Garden Act 2, Stardust Speedway Act 2, and Mirage Saloon for their visual design. They are my favorites. And that title screen. Wow. Probably the best Sonic has ever had. I do have a few minor gripes with the visuals, however. For one thing, what happened to the cool little save file icons you got in Sonic 3? These were so cool and helped set apart each save file from one another and made it clear that there were various different ways to complete the game. Sonic and Tails, all emeralds, or Knuckles, Chaos Emeralds only, or Tails, no emeralds, etc. My idea of getting 100% in Sonic 3 was always to have all of the unique save file icons present, and it's a shame Mania doesn't have anything like this. Another weird detail is the hand launchers in Hydro City don't play Sonic's maximum speed running animation like they did in Sonic 3. Worst game ever made, am I right? Again, these are nitpicks. A much more glaring absence of visual details in the sprites for Super Sonic, which for some reason don't have unique sprites for certain set pieces and objects, mainly anything that has a 3D effect. This was the same for the classic games, so I don't know if this is for nostalgia or just a lack of time. Probably both in a way. It's just odd because Sonic 3 Complete, a fan mod, fixed these problems. Mania is made by fans, so I don't know, I guess I figured they wouldn't want to leave in a problem like this. It's nothing game-breaking, it's just a shame. There's also something I want to talk about with the main character's sprites. Sonic's sprite is a remastered version of his appearance in Sonic 1 and CD, which I find very odd. This is a sequel to Sonic 3, which had a lovely sprite for Sonic, and they just sort of abandoned it in favor of what I assume is the more nostalgic one. Whatever, it doesn't bother me too much. What does bother me just the tiniest bit is the color palette. Sonic's sprite went for the much more modern classic Sonic look, if that makes sense. What I mean is his blue is too light. Yes, I am complaining about Sonic's shade of blue, that's where we're at in terms of nitpicks now. Sonic, back in the Mega Drive days, was a much darker shade of blue, and I think the only reason this light blue look has cropped up is from early Japanese concept art and an effort to distinguish classic Sonic from modern Sonic. Knuckles got a brand new sprite with a much more chaotic look to it that I really quite like, although he is a little bit pinkish, which I know is a turn-off for some. I quite like it, but the darker red from Sonic 3 is great as well. Tail sprite I have no problems with, really. He's a hybrid of his Sonic 3 sprite and some brand new ones, namely for his flying and top speed running sprite. Now, I've already addressed using mods for my PC version of Mania, and thankfully there are a few around to combat the color nitpicks that I mentioned. My friend Steve made two great color palette mods for Mania that I used to use all the time, until they started giving me this weird bug where I start every stage with a fire shield and a hundred rings. Sonic sprite looks so much better with his darker Sonic 3 colors and that richer blue. There's also the work in progress Sonic 3 XP mod by Capacitado, which replaces all of Sonic sprites with updated versions of his look from Sonic 3. This is one to keep an eye on for sure. I'm actually quite impressed in general with the modding community for Mania. I didn't think it would get anywhere near as large as this. I'm hoping that sometime soon we'll see impressive level packs, or new playable characters, or... Or, I, I mean, yeah, you could, you could always just do that, sure. Why not? Go for it. Uh, I, I won't, I, I won't stop you. And finally, the soundtrack. I've mentioned it a few times on here, but hot damn Telopes, my man, you knocked it out of the park. This is one of my all-time favorite Sonic soundtracks now, probably in my top three with Sonic Unleashed and Sonic Adventure. I've been a fan of Telopes and many other Sonic fan remixes on YouTube and SoundCloud for years, and when I heard he was doing the soundtrack, I was beyond happy for him. While some of the returning level themes do sound very similar to the originals, like Flying Battery and Hydro City, at least the original songs are so damn good already that I don't mind too much. Now, his original themes, along with his remixes of Stardust Speedway and Metallic Madness, are unbelievably good. I was listening to Studiopolis Zone the day it was revealed. What an absolute jam! I had a game rip of the full OST downloaded as soon as I could, and when the soundtrack was released officially on iTunes and Google Play, I bought that day one. 
Here's hoping an eventual sequel is 99% new themes so Telopes can really stretch his legs and deliver something this good all over again. In case I hadn't made it clear enough, or if you've forgotten from earlier in the video, Sonic Mania is the best Sonic game in over 20 years, and my second favourite Sonic game of all time. While Sonic 3 is held back by a few old elements, such as its aspect ratio, slower animations, and of course Sandopolis Zone, I think it will always deserve the credit as the better game, with an undeniable amount of ambition and passion at its time of release. The game had to be split between two cartridges for God's sake. I'm not trying to take anything away from Mania, because I love it to death but its identity is quite heavily built upon the shoulders of Sonic 3 and the classics before it. Without Sonic 3, there would be no mania. Sonic 3 is certainly less accessible, but what it lacks in accessibility it makes up for with stellar level design and creativity, not to mention a great soundtrack and cohesive art direction. Mania is far more accessible and features some wonderful modern design sensibilities, but it also lacks a lot of those little details that made Sonic 3 so great. And with that, I'm finished. I'm done. I had a script for this video floating around for months and then decided to scrap it and completely redo the whole thing. 25 pages of nonsense about Sonic Mania and I'm assuming this video is around an hour long based on my previous page to minutes ratio. If you've stuck around this long, then wow, you truly deserve praise and all of my thanks. I can only hope that this video has been informative and interesting for all of you watching and that you stick around to see what I do next time on my channel. Hopefully not something Sonic again, although unfortunately that seems to be the only thing that gets me much attention. Please let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on Sonic Mania and where it sits in your personal ranking of Sonic titles. Follow me on Twitter and other social media platforms to catch what I'm up to more regularly than my sparse upload schedule, or join my Discord where I currently don't do much in there because no one's actually in it. But you could change that! Special thanks are of course in order for the real telekinetic fan, Jamie Talliard. Thanks for popping in for this video and thanks for supporting me with all this stuff. When I thought about giving up on this video, I thought about how much you've encouraged me to keep me going, and it seriously helps so much. She better have more thumbs up than everyone else in the comment section, or I'm revoking all of your commenting privileges. Thank you again to everyone so very, very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time.